All right, as we have frequently done here in 2 Corinthians, we're going through chapter by chapter, it's important to continue to get the context from the previous chapter because, again, as uh, chapter or verse number one there in chapter seven starts off, it says, having therefore these promises. Well, what promises, right? Let's go back and take a look uh, just to get it in, in, in view here what we're talking about. Just go back real quick to verse number 17 in chapter six. The Bible reads, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So the promise is, hey, Come out from among them, I'll receive you, and you will be my sons and daughters. And that's a great promise to have. So now he's saying, having therefore these promises, hey, now that we've, we know this, we have the promise from the Lord, God is commanding us to come out from among them, to be separate, to be sanctified, to be holy, and uh, to touch not the unclean thing. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So since we know that, let's do it, right? That's what he's saying. Let's, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, obviously, there's two ways to achieve this. There's one way that is the, the permanent way. It's the eternal way. It's by putting your faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who will cleanse you from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit because you have a brand new spirit that's born again inside of you, right? And that way, that is perfected holiness by just being in Christ. But there's another side of this too, which is our daily life while we still do have this flesh of walking in the spirit and not in the flesh and try to uh, uh, strive to cleanse ourselves from the flesh, cleanse ourselves from that sin, and to walk in holiness in the fear of God every day of our lives. We have been commanded still to be separate, to touch not the unclean thing, and um, to, to continue to try to live a holy life. Verse number two, receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. And, you know, he's... <laughs> what, what's interesting here is that he says um, in verse number 17 of, of chapter 6, the Lord is saying, you know, touch not the unclean thing, be separate, and I will receive you. And now the Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Corinth saying, receive us to them. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Essentially saying, look, we've been walking holy. We haven't been living, you know, uncleanly and everything else. So receive us, right? We're, we're righteous and, and you ought to receive this. Now he says this in verse three, I speak not this to condemn you for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Now, it's important to understand with the preaching of the word of God, you know, this, no matter what's being taught, no matter what's being preached, it's not to condemn you. The preaching of God's word isn't to try to bring you down. Now, you may be guilty of, you know, breaking one of God's commandments. That's being preached. That's being taught. But the reason and the purpose isn't to condemn you. That makes sense. And we're, he's going to get into this a lot more. We talk about the, the godly sorrow that worketh repentance uh, and, and how this all fits together. But he, and, he, and he reiterates before he even gets into this, he says, you know, I speak about this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. You, you know, understand that you are in our hearts. You are very near and dear unto us. We love you. We care about you. So we're not saying these things to condemn you. But at the same time, hey, we need to teach the, the truth. And you need to know what the truth is. And you need to be holy. And you need to be sanctified. And you need to set yourselves apart. You need not to touch the unclean thing and say, look, you need to do these things. And we're not trying to condemn you, but that we're trying to teach you the right way. Understand that we do care about you. Verse number four. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. 
I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So now what Paul's doing is he's boasting of them a little bit. He's making them feel a little bit more comforted and, and a little better, even though he's, you know, he's delivering a message where there's going to be some hard truths. But at the same time, he wants them to understand, look, you're in my heart. My boldness of speech toward you is great. He's like basically saying, I have no reservations. I have nothing holding me back about speaking about you, about you, church at Corinth. You know, I am very bold when I'm going to open up my mouth and speak about you. He says, great is my glorying of you. I know that you're going to listen. I know that you have listened. I know that, you're, that you love the word of God, and I know that you're going to take this well. He's already saying this, saying, I'm bold and able to say that. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. So notice the difference, too. He's talking about great level of speech towards you, but then when he talks about our, he's talking about him and his helpers and the fellow disciples that were working with him. So he's, he's directing this letter to them, but then he's explaining their situation. So the Apostle Paul says, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. The hour isn't including the Corinthians. Necessarily. He's talking about his own company, his own group of people. He's saying, look, I am still exceeding joyful in all our tribulation, even though I'm going through hard times, even though you know, I've, I've got all these uh, various persecutions going on. He says, I am still joyful. And why is he joyful? It's because of the Corinthians. It's because of the church at Corinth. It's because of the report that he's hearing about them. We'll see this in just a second. He says, for, for he explains this, why, why are you exceeding joyful, Apostle Paul? Verse 5, for, means because, when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Everything's going wrong, man. There's all kinds of things going on around them without were fightings, right? So they get into an area that's kind of hostile towards them. So we get into Macedonia, it's like, man, this isn't going that well. There's a lot of fightings around us, right? So that's going to put you on edge. It's going to be a stressful situation. It's going to be something that you have to deal with. And he's saying, you know, without we're fighting, within we're fears, right? We kind of didn't know what was going to go on. There's a lot of fightings going on. What's going to happen to us? Now, of course, the Lord teaches that we shouldn't be fearful of anything, especially of anything that man can do unto you. But you know what? I think the Apostle Paul is just being a little honest here. He's saying, look, within were fears. He's not justifying it, but that was the truth. Hey, without were fightings, within were fears. And there is not a man on this earth that's never going to have some kind of fear when faced with all these fightings going on around you. There's going to be some there. And again, it's not to justify it or say it's right. It's truth, though. That's just the way it goes. Nobody has so much courage and so much strength that they're just above ever feeling any level of fear outside of the fear of the Lord. Hey, if you show me that man and, you know, I'd be ready to bow down and worship him because that would be like Jesus Christ or something, right? That's just not going to happen is my point. Without we're fighting, within, I mean, if the Apostle Paul of everybody can say, hey, within we're fears, look at how much that guy went through. And you're going to tell me, Oh, yeah, I would do it without any fear. Yeah, right. You know, sometimes Apostle Peter gets a bad rap. But, like, I was just, I was just reading a story, right, in our challenge, when, when he says, Lord, if it's thou, bid, th bid thou come unto me in the water, right? When you see Jesus is walking on the water in the midst of the storm, and they're out in the middle of the sea, and Jesus is just out there, and they're just looking out there being like, I think that's Jesus. Like, <laughs> is that a spirit? Is that a goat? Like, like, what is that? And then he's like, hey, it's I. Be not afraid. And... They're like, Peter's like, hey, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come unto the end of the water. He's like, well, ask me to come out there with you. And Jesus is like, come. Like, come on out. It's great. Right? And, and there's all these waves. There's a storm on a boat. And Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water to Jesus. I mean, that's amazing. But then what happens is like the, there's a wind blows and there's this big wave that pops up. And then he starts to get afraid. Right? Then, then he gets fearful and he starts to sink then, and he says, yo, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus saves him, right? There's no, there's no hesitation there. He saves him, and he says, yo, wherefore did thou doubt, O thou of little faith, right? And, and we could look at that and be like, yeah, Jesus is right. Hey, wh why did you doubt your little faith? But it's like, 
hey man, put yourself in that situation. He's literally walking on water. He's never done that before. <laughs> and then there was like this huge wave popping up. Like, Now look, he should have had more faith. Absolutely. But don't tell me that you wouldn't <laughs> have any fear getting out of the water and doing that and just walking, you know, like, you know, we got, we got to be real with this stuff. The Apostle Paul's being real here. Hey, without we're fighting, within we're fears. There's a lot of trouble going on, a lot of chaos, a lot of uncertainty. And, but he's explaining why he's exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Look at verse number six. Nevertheless... God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. So understand this, you know, when, when everything seems to be going wrong, when you have a lot of strife, when you have a lot of fightings, when you have persecutions, whatever's going on, and it might be kind of fearful for you, God comforted those that are cast down. God will comfort you. So we don't have to fear those things. Because God will comfort you, and he does it in, ver in a variety of ways. And here he's saying he comforted us by the coming of Titus. Okay, God used Titus to comfort the Apostle Paul and the other disciples who were being persecuted or going through tribulation. And just the presence of having another brother coming and visit you. Hey, I mean, how great is that? You're going through a hard time, and then someone that you love, someone in the faith, someone who, a fellow laborer, Someone that, that's like-minded with you comes and shows up. Hey, that's comfort in and of itself. And why am I bringing this up? Yes, the Lord directs our paths. The Lord will guide us. But, but allow yourselves to be used of God and to be sensitive to the leading of the Lord and be thinking about other people and be mindful. Because while the Lord did lead Titus to the Apostle Paul to go to him, Titus had to be in tune with the Lord's will as well and have his thought and his mind on the Apostle Paul as well and thinking, hey, maybe I should go over there and see where I could help out and see what I could do to help these brethren in their struggles, in their trials. And where we apply that to ourselves is thinking, hey, when you know people are going through a real hard time, real tough time, why don't you try to be a comfort for them by bringing your presence to them, by, by helping them out, by even dropping a line or writing a letter or doing something. When people are going through really hard times, reach out to them or just show up and help them out. That's a great blessing, and that will help comfort those that are cast down. And in so doing, I believe you'll be fulfilling the will of the Lord because God comforts those that are cast down. And just as much as God is sending people to preach the gospel, and there's ministers by whom everyone believes, I believe we're also ministers to comfort the brethren as well. Verse number seven. So he's saying now, he's going to expound on this, and not by his coming only. So we were comforted. Yes, we were comforted by the coming of Titus unto us. But not just his presence, not just his coming unto us, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. So what that means is that when Titus went to Corinth, when Titus went there, he received comfort by the church at Corinth. And then he relays this story. He's telling the apostle Paul, he's telling himself, oh yeah, man, when I was at Corinth, they, you know, were there, they, they, were, they had this great fire, they fired up to serve the Lord, you know, they're doing a great work there, things are going well, they, they love you, they're asking about you, you know, whatever, they're saying unto him how they comforted him, now that comfort goes another step further, because now the Apostle Paul is even further comforted, besides just Titus showing up, he's thinking, oh man, how great is that, now there's even more people, as it were, like, you know, on your side and more sense of comfort and support from other people going beyond, and that the work that you've been doing, while yes, right now it may be really difficult, and there's a lot of fightings, and it seems like you're not getting very far because of all the fightings and stress and turmoil, you've done some other work, and it's continuing to, to bring forth fruit and, and, and continuing to grow and survive and, and keep going forward, which is also a comfort in hearing about that from another brother in Christ. So he says this, and not by his coming only, verse 7, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, 
when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me. You know what that's showing? They really do love me. They care about me. Because Titus shows, oh, yeah, man, they're asking about you. you know, they're, they're grieving for you. They're, they have this earnest desire for you. They're praying for you. They care about you. Hey, that's just comforting for the Apostle Paul to get that message from someone that was just there. He says, so that I rejoiced the more. And, and what a great strength and comfort in a down time. In a time where everything seem, could seem to be going wrong and there's a fighting. Everything. You could be joyful in all of those tribulations. Now all of a sudden it doesn't seem that bad. Now you can get through it much easier. And, and at the end of the day, I mean, it's just people who are genuinely concerned and care about them and expressing that and showing that. This isn't just a secret love. They care about them, and they're, you know, they, they're, they're wanting to know and send forth their, uh, their thoughts with Titus. This same care and comfort is actually expressed to the Thessalonians as well. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And this is with Timotheus instead of with Titus, but same exact or very similar type of event going on here. This isn't just some one-off. This is something that happens and should be happening, I think, more frequently among brethren, among those that care. Hey, you hear about someone's going through these real, I mean, this is why, one of the reasons why we do the prayer request the way we do, and we pray for churches and for people who are going through the hard times to try to bring comfort to them. Now, they may not always know that we're doing that for them. Okay, and it's not a bad idea to let them know that we are praying for them and thinking about them. And drop a line, drop an email. It's, it, you know, it doesn't take much for you, but it could mean a lot for them. First Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear... We thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. He's talking about the afflictions again that they're going through, right? The apostle Paul and his, and, and his company are going through these afflictions and he's sending someone, he cares about these people so much, he's sending someone else to make sure that they're comforted, even though, hey, we're going through these tribulations and these hard times, but you guys, we want to make sure that you're comforted and that this doesn't throw you off at all and that you're not, you know, that this doesn't bother you and, and think like, oh, man, if this is happening to Apostle Paul, then we're just going to quit or something. You know, like he's trying, he's trying to strengthen them and say, look, 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 don't, don't let this bother you. He sends Timotheus to comfort them concerning their faith. He says, look, we already told you this. You know that we're appointed under this, right? So it shouldn't be a surprise. We already told you about this. This is how he's trying to comfort them and let them know, look, we told you this was going to happen, and now it's happening. Stay the course. Stay with it. Verse 4, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, he's like, I just couldn't wait any longer, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Don't underestimate the encouragement that you can give. You may not be going through the trials and tribulations and turmoil, and someone else is. But, oh man, you provide that support. You send that love, that encouragement. You let people know, hey man, we love you, we care about you, we're thinking about you, we're praying for you. 
you know, we pray that God blesses you. That alone is enough to bring, you know, where he says, look, now we live. You stand fast in the Lord. Look, we're, we're staying there. We're right there with you. We're not dropping out. And that is so important, especially for those who are going through the heat of the battle and going through some of the toughest times, is that they don't have their friends backing out on them. Oh, distancing themselves. Oh, yeah, I don't, I mean, that Apostle Paul guy, he's kind of extreme. Right? Yeah, it's the same guy that, that led you to Christ, but now all of a sudden he's kind of extreme. We're going to back, no. You need to be there for him. You need to be right there backing him up in his corner going, no, we love you, Apostle Paul. We're with you in spirit. Okay, we can't, may not be there bodily presence, but we're there with you in spirit. And that gives so much encouragement to, to someone in his position to be able to say, look, we're living because you're standing fast in the Lord. We're here today. We're comforted over you. And no matter what afflictions, distresses, everything else that we're going through, you are comforting us. And I'll tell you this much. Just being in church, every single individual, every one of you, is an encouragement to me. And I'm not going through the afflictions and everything else like the Apostle Paul and the disciples were going through. Like, I'm not even going to, you know pretend to think that anything that I go through is anything like that because it's not it's not even close but any of the stresses and things that I have to deal with as a pastor every single time I look out and I see every single one of you are important to me and you matter a lot to me and it's very comforting and encouraging just to see your faithfulness and you showing up to church and being here you say oh it doesn't really matter I mean who cares how many people we have in attendance look it's not the number that matters per se, it's the individuals. So don't think, well, it doesn't matter if I'm there. Yes, it does matter if you're here. Right. It does matter if you are here. Individually, you matter. And I'm, I may not always talk to you or greet you or, or have a conversation with you every time you're here, but I know when you're not here, I do. And, I mean, I don't, I don't really have any way to necessarily prove that to you other than just telling you, I do know when you're not here. And it's because I care about you and I love seeing every single one of you here today. And on Sunday, and on Sunday evening, and next Wednesday, and after that, and at the events and everything, I love seeing you guys here. It matters a lot. Okay? And you know what? It's not just me. Other people feel the same way. That's why it's not that hard for you to believe why I'm saying this, because you know for yourself that I, I guarantee you everybody in this room probably feels the same way, at least about half the people in this church, if, <laughs> if not all of them, right? I mean, can I get an amen? All right. <laughs> you do. You care about other people, and you notice when they're not here, and you think like, oh, wow, I wonder, I hope everything's okay with Brother Austin, I hope some, everything's okay with Brother Micah or Brother Peter. Like, I haven't seen them in a week or even in a service. They weren't here tonight. Oh, I wonder. I hope everything's all right. And then when you're here, man, that's great. That's joy. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You know, this is also why I love, I love church so much. I could be having the worst, most stressful, just bad day of things piling on one on top of another and just nothing seems to be going right to where I could have a really bad attitude and going, man, I don't even want to go to church tonight. I just want to go to bed. Or so, you know, like, you know what I'm talking about, Okay. And look, today might have been one of those days. <laughs> but I am on it. I love being here. I think this is, I am so happy that I'm forced to come <laughs> <laughs> by virtue of the responsibility I took upon myself in taking this position because, I, I, I mean, what, what a mistake it would be to not be here. The, the comfort, the joy, being around all of you really goes a long way. 
Now, the Apostle Paul did a really good job of expressing his love, his care, he, he's, he's, and his confidence in the church at Corinth. Now he's going to continue to explain a little bit about his last letter that he wrote, the book of 1 Corinthians, which has lots of issues addressed in it. I mean, that's 1 Corinthians is where we get our doctrine on who should be kicked out of church. So you want to talk about serious things going on at the church of Corinth. I mean, he's literally telling them, look, you got to put away this wicked person from among yourselves. That's just, and that's just one portion of the whole book. And there's just thing over and over and over again. There's all these different things that, he, that he's trying to correct them on. And now we're going to see a little insight into his heart when he penned down that letter. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. So he's saying, I don't repent. I, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I'm not changing my mind that I wrote that letter now. He says, but after I wrote it, I, I, I did kind of have second thoughts, is what he's saying. I, I was thinking, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't have wrote that. For I perceive that the same epistle, that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. He's saying, the reason why I did repent is because I understand that that epistle, that letter that I wrote unto you, it made you sorry. Even if it was just for a season, he's like, I understand it. But then in verse 9, he says, now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry. Just like he said in, in verse number three, you know, I speak not this to condemn you. He's not trying to bring you down. But he's like, I'm not happy that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, that something good came out of that. Because what's the point of making somebody sorry and then they're just mopey and down and sorry 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 and sorry. And sorry. But then they never do anything about it. And they never fix the problem. They never change anything. Then what's the point? Now you're just making someone feel bad for no, for ultimate, ultimately for no reason, right? So that, that's not his intent was to make, just to make someone feel bad just to feel bad. But he did like that it caused a change. So he's not sorry that he made them sorry. He's not changing his mind, oh man, I shouldn't have wrote that because I, made, because I might have hurt someone's feelings. No, he's actually very happy that he wrote that and that he did it, said it the way that he did and that it came across the way that it came across because they needed to feel sorry, but he's glad that they took it and received it the right way. He says, now I rejoice in verse 9, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world. See, when you, when you speak things that might be condemning to someone, you could either respond with godly sorrow or sorrow of the world. Sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world is a hopeless sorrow. It's one that you just, I mean, there's nothing to live for. There's no, there's no uh, coming back. There's just, there's, there's nothing you can do. You're, you're horrible, whatever. The sorrow of the world is, and, and think about how the world treats sorrow. How would they treat it? Well, they're going to treat it with, I mean, some people are going to treat it on their own with drinking, with drugs, maybe with some covetousness, going after money, going after these things to try to make them happy, to treat their sorrow, to treat their void, <coughs> to treat their emptiness. Pharmaceuticals, you suffer from depression, what do the world tell you? Go to a doctor and they'll give you some Prozac or whatever the, the, the current brand that they're pushing is. <coughs> it's drugs. If that's not drugs, what is? You're popping pills to feel better. Oh, they call it a chemical imbalance. Well, isn't methamphetamine a chemical? 
I mean, it is. What about cocaine? Isn't that a chemical? <coughs> Doesn't that affect the chemistry in your brain? But we're going to call one a pharmaceutical and we're going to call the other one an evil drug. Interesting, huh? You look at the drug dealers of the world, right? The, the ones that, that the rap and hip hop will, will promote, what are they doing? They're showing all their money, right? Well, what about the legal ones? The pharmaceutical industry is like the, 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 the most valuable, the most money churning industry like in the world. Oh, but they're not drug dealers. Okay. <clears throat> you know, sometimes sorrow is good. And sometimes it's normal and okay to not just always be happy in life and to actually have grieving and sorrow. Like Jesus Christ was a, was a man of sorrow and well acquainted with grief. And there was nothing wrong with him, and he didn't need anything fixed in his brain, and he didn't need to take any drugs to make him act like a zombie and just kind of live in this world where he's kind of like in a daze. And I'll tell you what, I've known people personally that have taken antidepressants, and that's what happens to them. I've known people before they took them and after they took them, and there's a change in who they are, and their personality becomes very dull. And it's kind of like they're stoned. Because that's what it does. And you know what? I've been around plenty of people who've been stoned before, so I know what that's like, too. Very similar. Because you're taking drugs. Because when you have sorrow, you need to deal with that sorrow and not mask it. And not just think it's the result of a chemical reaction in your brain. There is a cause for that. <laughs> and that's what people, you know, even as they study brain and stuff, Okay, you can say, you could do scans and say, well, this brain is different than this brain, and there's more, uh, these electrical impulses going on over here, and there's more activity going on over here. But we're not just physical beings because we have a soul and a spirit that have an influence on our physical being, on the decision-making that we do. We are not just a compilation of electrical impulses. I mean, it's essentially Calvinist yeah, right. to think that we have no soul or something or no other way of controlling our physical body other than just saying, oh, well, everything that you do is just, I mean, we could just pinpoint the brain and I could touch this part of your brain and you're going to do this and you're going to say that and you're going to think this and everything else and you could just be completely explained just everything by your brain. No, there's a cause for that beyond the physical there is a cause and it's and it's who we are that controls those firings and those different things that are going on in your brain you need to deal with the cause of the sorrow and it's not always easy to do for people some people go through very traumatic events but if you just treat it with drugs like it's a, a, a cold or something, you're not going to actually fix the problem. And since I've already gone this far in depth on the sorrow part, I will say my recommendation for anybody dealing with depression, it's help other people. Learn how to win souls to Christ. Just be a help for others. With, with what you do, the more you spend your time worrying and, and being concerned, not worrying, but being concerned for other people and helping other people, you will receive more joy as you help them. It feels good to help people in need in many capacities, not just the soul winning. Look, the soul winning is great. I think it's the best. But there's, there's many ways to help people out that can help you, especially if you're going through some really hard, depressive times. You just feel really sad and grieving and sorry. Spend your time with the word of God, with the light to keep you away from the darkness, and spend your time in, in helping others because that is, it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. 
Now, another aspect of this. So, so these people, the Corinthians, they were sorry after a godly manner, and what did that do? It, it evoked change in them. Real quickly, I want to just touch on this because there's this teaching out there that some people will teach. First of all, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. False doctrine, not true at all. Okay, when you really think about what does it mean to repent of your sins, that would mean, and, and especially by the definition that they'll use, is you have to basically give up your sins or be willing to give them up, whatever that means. Seriously, what, I mean, how do you even quantify it? Be willing? To, well, do you mean all of my sins? Well, wait, do you sin? Does that mean you weren't willing to give up that? Oh, no, no, I did it by mistake. I did, you know, uh, really? Are you going to tell me every single day that every single sin that you ever commit or will commit is all by accident, all by mistake, and none of it, none of them was anything you wanted to do? Not even one. Because if you were to admit that, you would have to say then, you did not repent of your sins. That's where it falls apart. And if that was what was required for salvation, then you'd have to come to the conclusion of, well, if I didn't repent of my sins, because I did something that I wanted to do, which was sinful, then I must not be saved. That's obviously false, okay? Now, what they'll continue to teach, though, and I don't want to spend much of the sermon on just that aspect of it, but what they'll say is, well, you need to have this extreme sorrow before you can be saved. Now, I'll start with this. Look, godly sorrow work at the repentance, and I'll say amen. I think a lot of people do get saved coming from a point of having extreme sorrow over their life, over their sins, over things they've done before they get saved. I will say I think a lot of people do come to Christ that way. So there's nothing wrong about that or saying that that isn't true or oh, that doesn't. Look, it happens a lot. What I'm saying is that it's not a requirement to have this level of extreme sorrow before you could possibly get saved. Because all you have to have is the repentance, whether it's from godly sorrow or not. Godly sorrow is not the only thing that leads to repentance, is my point. Hey, if godly sorrow leads to repentance, amen, right? And it does lead to repentance. But you can change your mind and be repentant on things without having to go through the emotion of sorrow. You could recognize your condition. You could recognize, man, and you have to, you must, to be saved, you must recognize your sinful condition and just be like, oh, man, I'm going to go to hell because I've already done all this stuff. You don't have to have this overwhelming feeling of sorrow for everything. You usually have to realize, look, man, I'm going to go to hell. And it's not always first and foremost on people's mind when they come to that realization of just feeling sorry for everything because it doesn't matter whether they're sorry or not. They're going, what am I going to do now? I don't want to die and go to hell. But then they hear a way out. They hear about Christ. They hear that God loves them. They hear about what Christ did for them and died on the cross. And they choose that. And they put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Hey, they're saved. Whether or not they had that extreme feeling of sorrow or whatever, you don't have to have that. But just real briefly, because we're on this particular passage, and this is what one of the passages you'll turn to to try to prove this doctrine, oh, you, you've got to be real sorry. They'll, they'll start off by saying this. Well, the law of first mention, and I've covered this many times in the past, in case you haven't heard it before, though, there's a principle of first mention in the Bible. It's not a law. And maybe we'll call it the law of first mention. It's not a law. And what the principle of first mention teaches, which I actually believe is, rel is, is true the majority of times, is the first time a word is used in the Bible, the Bible is kind of like its own dictionary. You'll find the definition for it to help you understand what that word means as it's used throughout the Bible. I have nothing wrong with that principle. 
But what people do is they take this too far and they call it a law. And turn, if you would, real quick to Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. Is that the other extremely important thing when understanding what a word means, and I would say is even more important than the principle of first mention, is the context. The way in which a word is used. Because many words have more than just one extremely specific definition for what it means. Depending on how it's used, now the meanings may be very similar to, they are very similar, you know, words have meanings that, that it's related. And you can see, oh yeah, this, this, is the, this means this, but if you use it this way, it could be slightly different, right? So you can't be super explicit and say, as is the case with the people who want to push this doctrine, they'll say, well, every time where people are going to see here, the first time that repentance is used, God was sorry. God was grieved. Therefore, every time repentance is used, there must be some grief. There must be some sorrow. This is the folly and the bad logic that people will go to to then try to prove this doctrine. But it's easy to prove wrong and illustrate this point. Genesis 6, 6, the Bible says, and it repented. This is the first usage of the word repent in any form. Right? Repent, repented, repentance, repenteth, whatever. This is the first one. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So was the Lord grieved that he made man? Yes. And was he even changing his mind about even making him? Yes. Yes. Because that's in the context, that's exactly what it says. Right. And were the people in Corinth sad and sorry over what they had done and all their failures and all the things where they were their, their, their shortcomings in following the Lord? Yes. They were sorry about it. They were grieved in their heart about it. And then they repented and got right with God. Right? So there's two examples of people repenting and grief being associated with that repentance. But that doesn't mean that that's always the case. Turn to Exodus chapter 32. Because I'm going to show you a passage here where, honestly, I don't see any sorrow or grief. I see anger, but I don't see grief or sorrow. So if you're going to use this Law of first mention, and it must always be like this, and this is just has to be the way it is. Hold on a second. Why don't you get the context? Because even the word repent itself, it's not clear unless you see the context of what the repentance is about or to or from. You know, people who teach you have to repent of your sins. Say, Every time the word repent is used, about sin. Well, then why did God repent? God doesn't sin. Every time, if, that's, the, that's the first point. Oh, you have to repent of your sins. When they said repent, they meant repent of your sins. Really? Because it doesn't say that. When Jesus and John the Baptist taught repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you're not going to find repent of your sins. Check me on that. Look it up for yourself. Because actually when the baptism of repentance was explained in the book of Acts, it was that they should put their trust or faith on him that should come after John the Baptist should be on Jesus Christ. That they should believe on Christ is exactly what John taught when he, when he, when he was uh, preaching the baptism of repentance. So he was teaching men, teaching men everywhere to repent, meaning believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, well, how is that repentance? Because they weren't believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they needed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So they had to change their mind and stop trusting in themselves, not trusting in Moses or in some set of laws, but trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a change. That is a clear change. That is repentance for salvation of your soul. Exodus 32, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. This is Moses 
entreating for the people of Israel whom God was about to destroy. And how does he do it? He's trying to use logic and say, look, God, if you do this, then the heathen, the Egyptians, are going to start spreading these rumors and start saying, oh, well, the real reason why he brought him out of Egypt was just to destroy him out here in the wilderness. When you and I, God, both know that that's not why you brought them out here, but if you do this, that's what they're going to say. So it's going to bring a bad name on you by doing this unto them, even though they deserve it, Lord, let's give them mercy because of that reason so that they can't blaspheme your name. This is the, the thinking and the reasoning that Moses is using with God. So, so he, he requests, turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. So then, of course, he brings up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? He brings up these people, and, and it says in verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Let me ask you this. Where's the sorrow? Was he sad that he wasn't going to destroy the people? <laughs> like, man, I wanted to destroy him. Now I'm just upset. Now it grieves me that I can't destroy this people. It doesn't make any sense. See, I think God's happy over that repentance to destroy his people because in Moses, Moses is being Christ-like. Moses is entreating the way that God would want him to entreat for the people, to be that true picture of Christ that is to come, that was going to be that real prophet to stand and, and be the intercessor for the people. I think it pleased God well to repent of the evil that he was going to do unto the children of Israel. I don't think he was grieved at all. And we don't see it. More importantly, we don't see it in the context. All that said to just say, look, you can't just take something and say, oh, this is the law of first mention. And now we're just going to run blindly with that. Challenge it. Test it. See, they'll try to prop up, and they could bring up a few uh, verses and say, see, look, here, God's grief. See, look, here, there's grief. See, look, here, there's grief. Yeah, but how about, see, look, here, there's not? Yep. You don't always have to have grief. Now, look, as I said before, godly sorrow is a great thing. And many people, myself included, had a godly sorrow at my moment of conversion to Christ. Because I had plenty of sorrow going on, and I needed to turn to the Savior to save me. And I had a lot of grief and sorrow. But you know what? That's my story. That's not everybody's story. Going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to see the results of what did this godly sorrow do for the, uh, the church of Corinth. Verse 11, he says, For behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. So that letter that made them sad, how did that result? Now they're going to be more careful. Now they're going to be careful with the word of God. They're going to say, oh, you know what? We, we probably ought to look at this a little bit more closely and not just be so flippant about things. Maybe we ought to look to the word of God carefully and make sure we're doing things right. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. What does that mean? They got right. They cleared out the problems and said, okay, well, obviously we're doing this wrong. Let's get rid of that. Let's not do that anymore. Let's put this wicked person away from among us. Let's do what we're supposed to do and clear ourselves and clear our name of this bad report that's coming upon us. Let's clear it. That's what godly sorrow does. It says, hey, man, I can't believe, man, we did all these things. Oh, I don't know. Well, let's get it right. Let's move forward. Let's clear ourselves. Let's work on this. 
Yay, what indignation. I mean, it fired him up. Hey, we're not going to be known like this. We're better than that. Let's, let's serve the Lord. They're indignant about it. Yay, what fear. Hey, but the fear of the Lord. They needed some of that too. With their carefulness. Right? Now they're going to get a little bit of fear of God in their life. Yea, what vehement desire. I love that, that, that adjective, the vehement desire. Not just uh, desire or adverb, the vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. They got stirred up, man. They got the word of God. It hurt. It stung. They're like, oh, man. Oh, did you have to bring that up and that and that? But then you know what? Hey, let's get things right. Let the word of God work in your heart. When whatever comes out of this book just pierces right through and just goes, oh, and it stings. And, you're, and, and you start to feel bad, like, man. I mean, maybe... Maybe it's something you've been doing, and you didn't even know it was a sin. You were ignorant about something, and you find out, hey, this is sinful, this is wicked, this is wrong. You, you, you probably will feel bad about that. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you do feel bad about your sin. Because you're actually in a bad position if you're not feeling bad for your sin. Hopefully you do feel bad about your sin, and you feel bad enough to change, to get Right, to say, I, you know what, I'm not going to be brought into this bondage anymore. I want to be in good standing with the Lord. I want to clear myself. I want to do what's right. That's the attitude we ought to have. And, you know, the more you can have that, the more carefulness and close attention you're going to have for your sins instead of being tolerant and accepting of all of your sins. It's good to feel bad about what you do that's wrong. That's the whole goal of hard preaching. And if you hear the hard preaching, don't let yourself get swallowed up in sorrow. Just change. You have the choice to make. Even, even in the midst of addictions, because addictions can really cause people to get, to get sorrowful. The reason why is because they know what they're doing is wrong when they get real sorrowful and, and will then oftentimes repeat that pattern. And it can get you more and more sorrowful about what you're doing. But why, instead of allowing that sorrow that now to, to drag you down the wrong path, the, the worldly sorrow... That's going to say, well, why don't you drown your sorrows? Well, you've already done it this time. Why don't you just do it again and just make yourself feel a little better? No, that's the world's hopeless sorrow that's going to continue that cycle. Why don't you break out of it and just change? And look, oh, I can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Maybe you just need some com comfort and support. You know who's going to provide that for you? God. How about you seek God and get yourself around God's people because God's people are going to love you and they're going to try to help you, help you and comfort you as well. Get yourself in church. Get yourself helping other people will help get you away from that, that addictive cycle that is just going to cause you more sorrow. Look at verse number 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. And this is a really interesting thought right here, because he's saying, you know what, when I, when I wrote that to you, I didn't do it for the person that did wrong, and I also didn't do it for the person that was wrong, right? So the event where one person does wrong to another person, and, and, and he, he kind of, you know, he dresses this, he said, I didn't really do it for either of their sakes, but for you as a whole, that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. 
Why? Because he cares enough about them to tell them the truth and not to cover anything up. And he just said, I'm going to teach you all of this, and you're going you're gonna to see our care for you in exposing these things. I mean, they were covering up these sins, you know, the, that, you know, there's a man in the congregation that had his father's wife committing fornication that, that isn't even mentioned among the heathen. You know, it was just so perverted and weird and wicked and bad. And no one in the church did anything about it, said anything about it. Oh, yeah, it's fine. But the Apostle Paul called it out. And he could be talking about that, that specific thing. Maybe his dad was in the congregation. Who knows? We don't know. But, you know, the son's doing wrong against the dad. He's like, I didn't do it for either of their sakes. I did it for you guys just so you understand. And no, look, this is my care for you. I'm going to call this out. And, and it's not okay. And you're going to know right from wrong. You're going to hear the truth from the word of God. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. And again, we're reiterating that, that comfort that he got after he heard their repentance, their godly sorrow, and everything that they did to change, and then their care for the Apostle Paul. We shouldn't be afraid, and pastors shouldn't be afraid to preach hard, to preach on sin, to preach the word of God, and think, oh, no, you know, no one's going to like me. Right? I mean, it's a stupid thought. Why do you care if anyone likes you anyways? If it's right by God, just preach it. Just, just say the truth. But what's funny is that a fear of, of oh, everyone's going to hate me, or so-and-so is going to hate me, even just not everyone, just one person. If you think one person's going to hate you, oh, well, this person's caught up in that sin, so if I bring it up, they're going to hate me. No. If, if they're wise, they'll receive it, and then they'll love you even more. I can't express the love that I have for Pastor Anderson and getting in a church that had really hard preaching because that's what I needed. I needed the Word of God thundered out, and guess what? I changed a lot of things in my life, and I am so gracious and thankful for that. Enough to where, hey, why don't I go and try to help and do the same thing with other people? You should love the person who's trying to show you the right way, tell you the truth from the word of God. I mean, it's the same reason, you know, the person who gets saved is going to love you and not hate you for telling them about hell. Hell's not a very pleasant place. And telling someone, hey, you deserve to go to hell. Well, if they get saved, I guarantee you they're going to love you for it. So just telling them the truth. Instead of lying to him, oh, no, it's okay. Oh, you're, you're a Muslim? Like, we, yeah, we, we serve the same God. Yeah, right. Oh, you're, you believe, but you believe in Jesus? Okay. Oh, you're a Catholic? And, oh, yeah, of course, you believe in Jesus. No. Don't lie to him. Where I leave off, verse number 14, for if I have boasted in anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. So if I boasted anything about you guys to Titus, he's like, I'm not ashamed. Because you've already backed up my boastings of you. You, 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 are, you are standing true to what I said. Because, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. He's saying, you know what? If I boasted of you. You, you've stepped up and you have fulfilled that boasting. You're not, you're not making me a liar here, right? You're, you're, you're showing that it is found a truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. And he closes it with that. Turn, if you would, to, to, to the book of 3 John. I'm going to close on this. That last verse, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. He's, he's just expressing 
hey, I boasted about you guys. The things that I said came to pass. They were true. You backed me up. I was, I was talking about you. I was telling Titus how great you guys were. I was telling him how awesome you are and how much you love the Lord and everything else. And you know what? You proved yourself to be true. You proved my boastings to be true. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. That's a great joy. It's a joy that he felt is similar to what's expressed here in 3 John, uh, verse number 1. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. What's he saying here? The same thing. I heard when the brethren came and they told me, yeah, Gaius is walking in truth. Yeah, man, I mean, he's serving the Lord. He's a great, you know, he says, I have no greater joy than that, that I'm hearing this report about you, that I hear that you're walking in truth. That's great. He loves him. And it's, you know, this is his son after the faith. The, the, the church at Corinth, Paul was instrumental in this church getting founded and started and the souls that were saved and things like that. These were his children after the faith. And you know what? He cares about them. He's thinking about them. He loves them. And then when he hears a good report, we're like, wow. They're walking in truth. They're serving the Lord. They're, at, they're doing these things. They've received the teaching of God, and they're continuing to grow and increase. Hey, praise the Lord. That's joyful. That brings joy. And, you know, this type of joy, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. You need to toil. You need to put in the effort. The more you do that now, the more joy you'll have later. I tell you what, man, it is great. The longer you're in church, the longer you're in ministry, the longer you serve, the longer you go soul winning, the more you meet other people and other believers and stuff, and then years go by, and then you see people after 10 years, after 15 years. Do you know how encouraging it is then after that length of time to just see some of the same people be like, praise God, you are still serving the Lord. That is a joy. I love every time I get to go back and visit in Arizona and see the people that I was church members with, like, what was that now, 15 years ago? 15 years. Still going soul winning, still being faithful, still serving the Lord. Hey, they may not be doing anything dramatically different, but that is a huge encouragement. Huge encouragement. You know why? Because a lot of people don't stay faithful. A lot of people do back out. A lot of people do get caught up with the cares of this world. A lot of people do faint. A lot of people do just, just fall out of church. Don't be one of them. There is joy to receive, and there is joy to give. There is comfort to receive. There is comfort to give. You get both through your service to the Lord. Stay with it. You think things are tough for you? If nothing else, why don't you think about the other people that you can be a comfort to on those days and those times where you think that, like, man, I just don't even feel like going, I don't even want to do any of this stuff anymore. Think about the other people that may be looking to you, that may be friends with you, that may care about you. And if you say, well, I don't think there's anyone like that in this church, you have at least one. You have at least one. I guarantee you have a lot more. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing this church together, for building this body of believers. God, thank you for your word and for all the wisdom and the truth that we could learn from it. Lord, I pray that you would please help just help this church to grow in unity and faith and in spirit, dear Lord to serve you to our utmost. I pray that you please help us to live lives where we continue to improve on our holiness and sanctification and we could separate ourselves from the, the cares and concerns of this world and that we can truly just, just live day to day in, our, in service to you. And I pray that you would help us to, to bring glory and honor unto your name and that uh, we can just fulfill the work that you've set out before us to, to reach people and to bring them unto Christ. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.